Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Can you see hello. me? Hello. I can see you and I can hear you. Can you hear me and see yeah, me? Yeah, that's fine. I had seen you the video on the concept of immortality, which was very interesting to me. And, and, I, and as I was saying to you <laughs> in my email, when I was a kid, I always had this uh, odd, I don't know, it's probably not an odd thought. I'm sure many people have had it, but I used to always say to my friends about the, the idea of living forever freaked me out, but the idea of not living forever freaked me out equally. <laughs> Did you ever have that kind of thought when you were younger, or when you were growing up, philosophizing about life? Uh, I, in fact, defend immortality of three separate sorts. And I think it's quite likely we have all three of them, but certainly two of them seem to be defended in some way or supported by modern physics. Mm -hmm. The third one is um, immortality of the afterlife, which large numbers of people who don't know anything about physics already believe in, okay? So these are three sorts of immortality which we might discuss in turn, yes? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the first sort is a sort which Einstein believed in, though he never called it immortality. But when he was writing to the relatives of his dead friend, Michele Besso, he said that uh, we physicists know that the difference between past, present and future is it's all illusion. Now, I'm a professional philosopher, at least I was before I retired. <laughs> um, and uh, you can't simply dismiss that that sort of difference is mere illusion. But what you can say is that the ordinary way in which people look at past, present and future is, is wrong. And part of the ordinary way is to say that when you're in the past, you're over and done with, you've dropped out of reality. The only thing which is real is the present moment. And as soon as you've dropped out of present moments, you're finished. Now, what Einstein was trying to say to the relatives of Michele Besso was that, that that's wrong, that reality is in fact a four-dimensional whole. And therefore, at the moments when people correctly say you're dead, you're alive back there along the fourth dimension. Right. <laughs> How do you react to that sort of idea? Um, I'm kind of agnostic about every idea. I'm not... I. I, I... It's it's odd. I, I sometimes I think I, I I wouldn't say I'm religious, but I'm not I'm not I don't know all the answers, so I can't say there is or there isn't. I highly believe it's unlikely the way people think that you die and you go to heaven and there's angels everywhere. But because we are kind of part of the universe and when we do die, we kinda of do live forever. Maybe in the not with the way we want to live forever, <laughs> but we do live forever in a certain way, and as the idea of it is good. I, 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 living forever and existing forever is always a weird. I, one I think for me. actually that that would confuse two sorts of immortality. The second one I will talk about being part of a universe which lives forever. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, but um, what about this Einsteinian idea that? when somebody correctly says you're dead, you're dead only in this particular slice through space-time, which they call now, and they, they rightly say you're in the past, but at the same time, <laughs> being in the past is like being, say, in Africa to somebody who's speaking from Canada, being elsewhere but you really are alive back in the past. I, I found that a lot of people resist this on the grounds that they think it wouldn't really help them accept the fact of their deaths, the, the fact they're going to be dead. They think it, it, it 
it just wouldn't matter either way. And I say, well, are you happy with the idea that Joan of Arc is eternally being burned back there <laughs> along the fourth dimension? They say, oh, what a horrifying thought. Okay, well, think of all the nice things you live through. Aren't you happy that they, wouldn't you similarly be happy that they are in existence back, would be in existence back there when you died? And a lot of physicists do accept this uh, four-dimensional view of the universe that um, it's all there as a four-dimensional block. And the philosophers these days tend to call it eternalism. Okay. And the physicists who've really thought about this matter, who know anything about relativity theory and so on, they, they are all, uh, no, not all of them. <laughs> An awful lot of them are, are rather keen on this idea. And, and there is um, fairly good evidence, I think, for this idea. And it's evidence which persuaded Einstein himself. He didn't like the idea. And in the end, Minkowski persuaded him that Einstein's theory of relativity made much more sense against the background of this idea that the universe really is four-dimensional. Yeah. And then Einstein wrote that um, the difference between past, present, and future is, is in some way an illusion. <laughs> As I said, <laughs> wrong way of stating it, but uh, yeah, a good point. When you look at that idea, does that in any way attract you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a cool idea. It's, you know, as humans, we're kind of taught that we live, we die, you know, we exist in a certain way and time is, is a thing. And I'm, I, I'm not sure, like time is, is only relative to us because we have a, you know, we, do, we have a, we have a time that we live and we die. So. Uh, the, Just as uh, we're in Canada, in my case, you're in Ireland, aren't yeah, you, in your case. Yeah. And other people are, are in Africa. Well, the thing is that this particular view of time sees it as relative as the difference between existing in Canada and existing in Africa. Uh, people in the past who are in our time non-existent, they're existing in the past and they continue to exist in the past. And this doesn't just say that they did exist in the past. They really are there now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like that idea myself. I think uh, this is comforting because I've, well, I've had some pretty miserable moments, but uh, on the whole, I'm very glad to have been living and seeing, doing all the things I've done. Yeah. And I'm glad that they're not going to be wiped out. And I'm particularly glad that people like my son, my wife, and so on, people I'm particularly fond of, they will never, I think, be wiped out of reality as long as our universe exists because the universe is a four-dimensional universe uh, maybe some demon will come along and <laughs> destroy the whole lot <laughs> but i think that's un i think that's unlikely so it's going to be there forever and yeah. uh, all these people i've been direct with my best friends and so on they're going to be there uh, i myself find that uh, very comforting do you find the? I have, find have it. I, I persuaded find it you at all. I, no, I find it's just it's such a strange. Because I think for you know the the phrase you live in the present, when you live in the present, you're kind of alive. I mean, you can you can look back to the past and you think. So even though you're still alive in the past, it doesn't feel like you're alive because you know no, my no, no, brain. No, no, that's right. That's right. That's right. And you can say such things as, "Thank goodness that." Toothache is over. Yes. But on this on this view of mine, of course, this this toothache is just not being felt at the moment, but yeah. it's still there, it's still yeah. real. You know, it it, mm. it has its nasty side to it. So as I say, if you think about uh, Joan of Arc being eternally burned, if you think that being at being burned alive is being a, an experience of negative value. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, Catholic's official view is that nothing has negative value. Values just go down to zero, and being burned alive is above zero, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the normal view is that 
being abundant alive would be of negative value. And my idea that the world is four dimensional as Einstein thought it was, commits me to believing in the reality of some horrible things which keep on being horrible, you know? But yeah. also of some very nice things which keep on being nice. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that I'm very happy with as, as an idea. I'm glad that the universe, if it is like that, I'm glad that it is like that, yeah. Is that like, so it's so basically all time is happening at once? There is, time is the past, fre present. In, in a way, that would be one way. Of course, if you took it to mean that all time is happening now, uh, that would be wrong because that would be like saying Africa is happening here <laughs> yes, when I'm in yeah. Canada. You know? Yeah. But um, all time is happening at once. And one of the reasons for saying this sort of thing is that sometimes people seem to see particles going backwards in time. Mm -hmm. But how could they go backwards to a place which isn't there? <laughs> um, there's, um, if, if you have a certain reactions, you, you, you have a particle going along and then it gives rise to another one. And the reason it gives rise to another one is it another particle has come in and hit it, causing it to create the other one. Mm -hmm. And the other particle which comes in and hits it comes from the birth of two particles which then split apart. So you have particle ha happily going along, beside it creation of two particles, one of them hits the first one and the other one goes off. And so if you had a space-time diagram of this, you'd have a W. <laughs> no, sorry. Is that a W? No. You'd have a zig. You'd have yeah. a zigzag. And the simplest way of looking on this is to say, well, that particle did go back in time and there was a time to, <laughs> to which it went back. It just took a zigzag path. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to many physicists that the difference between the present moment and other moments around it is a relative matter. And one of the reasons for this is when they try to find out the absolute speed at which we move through space, they found they couldn't. The experiment which was meant to show the absolute speed through space would show the same thing to everybody no matter how fast they were moving through space. This was a, a very strange idea. But in the end, it got to be accepted. And um, the only way I can see of making good sense, simple sense of this is to say that um, space and time are melded together. This is the, the view that Einstein came to believe correct. That uh, as Sir James Dean said in his book, The Mysterious Universe, just as a cricket ball doesn't know the difference between the length and the breadth and the width of a cricket field, it just moves. <laughs> anyway, uh, so particles sometimes seem to be moving without being affected by this difference which we always keep seeing between space and time. They really are melded together. And therefore, exactly how you divide space and time exactly how you see what is the present will differ for different people. If I simply walk across the room, I'm not accelerating very fast, but this will mean that I will, if I could see events on a, dis, a distant star, I would suddenly see a jump of a few thousand years <laughs> between what was now on the star and what was then I saw as now in the star. This is all very hard to make sense of unless the, the world really is four dimensional. Right. And um, that, as I say, would have its disadvantages, but I, I think it's a comforting idea. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm dead, I'm, I've had a sufficiently happy life that I'll be on the whole happy. <laughs> back there along the fourth dimension.
Yeah. That, that's how that idea works. Uh, but there are these other sorts of immortality as well, and uh, maybe we move on to that and go back to the first one. Go, if, t- if, if tell, me, like. tell me as many of them as you want. I'm all, yeah, I'm all, all keen for listening. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 there's only uh, two others which I'd want to defend, and the, mm-hmm. the second one is the view that the universe is all one single thing and we are just aspects of that thing in the same way as the um, I see you have a sort of purple looking uh, jumpsuit on yes it's got a <laughs> well, blue as it's got a blue aspect is it or and it's kind, got of, a, kind of blue bit blue and yeah a bit red. and it's also got a, a very red aspect and yeah. these are two aspects and they're part of the same thing it couldn't be that the blue aspect simply wandered away and <laughs> yeah. left the red aspect behind, you know, and suddenly uh, appeared without being the blue of, of anything. You know, it, these two things are united together. And a lot of physicists think that everything in either our whole universe or at least a large part of it is mixed up with everything else mm-hmm. and doesn't have any separate existence. And this is in view, uh, in line with um, the sort of view you often get in the Far East when they talk about Brahma. Brahma is everything, okay? And uh, in in fact, uh, the famous physicist Schrodinger, very important developing quantum mechanics, um, was... Uh, a believer, he said, in Hinduism's world, in the world of the Upanishads. And that world as a unity where it's, it's all Brahma and Brahma is the single existent thing which thinks the universe into existence, let's say. We are parts of Brahma's thoughts. Well, you don't have to go all the way of it, saying we are parts of the thoughts of us a thinking thing. You can simply say everything in the universe is in fact linked to everything else by what um, the quantum physicists call entanglement Mm -hmm. and by what they call superposition. In the case of entanglement, any two particles which have interacted keep on being to some extent entangled And in some cases, the entanglement becomes very dramatically present when you have the birth of two particles at a particular point and they shoot off in different directions. If if you make a certain measurement on one particle, the other particle apparently immediately knows it. (laughs) If you put the first particle through a polarizer, oriented in a certain direction. If it gets through the polarizer, the other particle will behave exactly similarly, you know. And this seems like magic, magic acts, action at a distance. And even Einstein thought, you know, this is all nonsense. And then he was, <laughs> was persuaded, no, it, it actually takes place. Yeah. Um, now, Relativity theory says you can't have instantaneous action at a distance between two particles, but the answer is, well, we're really, we have one particle in two places here. And um, that's the standard way of looking at it. You'd, very, you'd find it very difficult to be a quantum physicist if you didn't recognize that at least a great part of the universe we see, we can only see a limited part of it mm-hmm. because of the limited speed of light, you know. Um, a great part of that is is all one thing. You couldn't change any part of it without having some effects on all the other parts. In most cases, very s- small effects, sometimes very dramatic effects, as in this case of uh, entangled particles born at the same place and going off in different directions. Mm -hmm. All this suggests that when you're dead, you will 
the thing which carried your life pattern will continue to be there. And this, after all, is what people who believed in the immaterial soul thought. They thought that um, there would be something which survived their deaths. It'd be something which had carried their thoughts or their experiences before they died. And this underlying thing which carried the pattern of their lives, their thoughts, experiences, that was going to continue on after they did. Yeah. Well, this modern physicist view isn't a belief in the soul, but it is a belief that what actually carries your life or carries my life is one and the same thing. Uh, and so in a way, if I'm nasty and rude to you, <laughs> I'm suffering. <laughs> That's to say that the thing which carries me and the thing which carries you are the same thing. And one of my philosopher friends uh, went as far as to say, yeah, this is a good reason for being nice to other people, that they are carried by the same single thing which is carrying you. you know, don't be selfish. Mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly compatible with being very selfish, very nasty, because people can be interested in not just what carries their patterns, but their own life patterns, and they can not be interested in other people at all. Okay. Yeah. It's possible to be somebody like Al Capone, you know, who's obviously <laughs> utterly selfish, or uh, dare I say... No, I won't, won't bring in modern politics. God, I no. could mention one or two. <laughs> God, before. no. Yeah. All of them we can mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, how, what is your own take on this? Is first, uh, would you get any comfort from the fact that after you're dead, what carried your life pattern would continue onwards? And two, um, uh, are you going to be nicer after this interview? <laughs> I always try and be nice. To other people. <laughs> I always try and be nice. The con I, it's weird because you know the concept of being. I was like you were saying about like Al Capone, someone like him, who did awful things. You know, people like that guy's an awful person. But if you were to talk to his family, who he probably could have been nice to, and they'd be like, "No, he's lovely to me." And the concept mm. of nice, it's like, is it based around? who's nice to you or is it based around a whole co our, our society of what nice is and it's all I, I always think that's a weird thing that doesn't mean i'm not nice to people but i i'm always interested of like with concepts of being nice of like that people what is nice because someone could go oh, i don't like that person they go oh, he's a lovely person to me he's nice so in their reality he's a nice person but in their in my reality he or she isn't a nice person and but yeah, would I you be more willing to be nice to a nasty person uh, <laughs> in view of what I've just... I mean, Depends supposing... Depends how I'm, nasty they were to me. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I'm trying to sell you on the idea that really the difference between you and the other person is differences between the patterns which are carried by one and the same thing. I get you. And yeah, yeah. therefore, in a sense, if you're interested in that, you would be more interested in possibly being even nicer than you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like the concept, though, because it's like it, it, it does um, encourage us to be nice, you know, because it's like if I hurt, you hurt. And if I laugh, yeah. you laugh, that kind of that kind of concept. And it's, it's w uh, would it encourage you to be I don't know to what extent you dislike the idea of dying in the end, but would it help you to be reconciled to the idea of dying and saying, well, in a sense, I'm going to be immortal? In, in... I don't know. Do I want to be immortal? That's something I've always struggled with, even if it's in the not the way of like that we, you know, would say the religious way of you die, mm -hmm. even if that that concept, it was it's always a thing I've um well, ended ten minutes. How was that? Um, it's always a thing that um, I kind of struggled with. I was like, uh, uh, I didn't really know how to handle that because it's like um, just the idea of dying is odd, but the idea of living is odd, and they're two—they're kind of two in the same for me. That that kind of way. So I'm not sure. 
I don't know. I guess I don't really have a family, and I think when you have a family and you feel like that, you really probably want to live for live more because you it's them, and you know. I don't have kids, so maybe if I had kids, it would change my perspective, perceptive, on on thing. But I don't know. It's a uh, ask me. Yeah. In t- ask me in five years. <laughs> I mean, w- one reason which a lot of people have for actually dreading the idea of being immortal is that they think they'd be terribly bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, oh, that's I, probably one for me. I think I'd be bored yeah. too. I'd run out of um, money. <laughs> but I mean, there, there's two things here. Um, supposing you could have something which would keep you permanently interested, uh, would you love the idea of immortality? I, I know that some people are so keen on chess, they keep on playing chess forever. And I've, I, I've, I've done so that. <laughs> years back in the game of Go, there was somebody who spent all his time, all his time, all his baking moments thinking about Go, playing Go, and so on. Now, they wouldn't apparently get bored, but the view I'm trying to suggest might be attractive is that you get to die, mm-hmm. your life pattern ends there, mm-hmm. but um, other people are having interesting new lives, you know? <laughs> yeah. and in a way, what, what carried your life is now being carried by them. And if you had kids, it would not just be that uh, you happen to be related to them by giving birth to them, but there would be this underlying single thing which carries their lives too. And Mm -hmm. in in a lot sort of way, you'd be benefiting from this, at least uh, for me, because uh, I'd be quite... if I believed in this thing called the soul, it mm-hmm. would comfort me. Mm-hmm. I, I would think that it could go on thinking and so on. This thing which carries my pattern, the pattern of my life, my experiences would continue to carry that pattern. And I might be attracted by the idea of, of um, reincarnation for mm-hmm. this soul. I might think, well, yes, I'm going to perhaps in the next incarnation be very different. I'm going to be an elephant, (laughs) for example. (laughs) Elephants are usually by the Hindus look on as lower down the the scale than the men, you know, so that would be a demotion for me. But I'm going to have fun being an elephant. (laughs) (laughs) This... um, this is uh, that that would be an attractive idea, and it would mean that I wouldn't get get bored. You know, after a few years of being a, an elephant, maybe I wouldn't mind being dying off and becoming a terms of my soul going into a man. Mm-hmm. But um, during those years, I I, I try to be a happy elephant, <laughs> an interested <laughs> elephant, have have all have all the joys of being a young elephant. I think one of the finest times of life is finding out about this universe, finding out space and time and people and and so on. First five years are the the best, I think, probably, Mm -hmm. of most people's lives, unless they really are extremely miserable. Yeah, That's the second sort of immortality, which um, I think is uh, physics is telling us we have it. The thing which carries our life patterns in the same way as the immortal soul was meant to carry your life pattern. That is, in fact, the the universe, and that universe is going to go on, mm-hmm. go on being there. And it's going to have all these other lives, interesting lives, a great many of them pleasant lives, a great many of them horrible lives, unfortunately, some of them, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the second sort, and I hope I can persuade you that, <laughs> <laughs> that there's there's something nice in that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah there is something nice in it. It's it's uh, yeah. It's, it's, it might be odd to call it immortality, but that's just a matter of words, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, and perception of what perception of immortality is. You know, I think we're so 
we're so taught that immortal our you know we'll say that the commercial view of immortality is hanging out with god and angels i think that's kind of you know the, the we're that's what's beaten into us as we're anyways when i was a kid anyways being a catholic or growing up that's that's the idea of of god was our immortality so yeah well they the view which is most commercialized in the west would be that we all have immortal souls and mm -hmm. they are going to go to heaven and they're going to be tremendously interested in what they find there i hope we wouldn't if i could have and i hope i wouldn't spend all my days just singing songs <laughs> on the cloud you know? well, i might get very bored by that <laughs> well i always thought it was odd like if if there is a heaven and you got married to someone and they passed away and then you remarried who are you with in heaven because that's your heaven that might be their heaven it's like well would that not be hell for them if they're looking at you you know it's a weird it's all <laughs> there's so many things of of the idea of heaven that don't make sense to me well anyway i'm not trying to in any way i'm not myself a, a believer in in any religion i have, have <laughs> been converted to christianity or buddhism or the muslim view of of life all all of these have different sorts of immortality mm -hmm. in some of them immortality takes the form of dissolving into brahma if you are a hindu who believes in brahma brahma lives all lives and so on and some of them think that at death you just dissolve in there right and you don't keep your personality and so on that's the view of the Chandogya Upanishad. But when you come into the Taitariya Upanishad, uh, you don't lose your personality. You don't lose all your past memories and so on. You continue and you tour the divine reality, mm -hmm. possibly changing your shape at will, they suggested in the writings of this Upanishad. But you get to experience more and more of um, of God by going through all the things which God knows, going through infinite divine knowledge and so on. And this view greatly uh, attracts a, a friend of mine, Keith Ward, who, not at the moment, he, he was a Regis Professor of Theology at Oxford. Mm -hmm. And he has this view that after this he's he's going to dissolve into God but keeping his personality but knowing more and more of the things which God knows and getting to understand the entire history of the universe and so on and so on uh, which he, he finds a nice idea it's kind of cool um, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that the defenders of the Chandogya you that you simply dissolve away into Brahman, they think that that is not losing something important because mm -hmm. the substance underneath them is the single thing which lives their lives is Brahman, and mm -hmm. they're going to exist as part of Brahman. Actually, Schrodinger, who I mentioned, has the odd view that in some sense we're all of us all of Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Which I, I, I can't make any sense of that. <laughs> but he, he reads that into the Vedantic tradition of uh, Hinduism, hmm. which he said he, he accepted. And I, I've got an actual quotation from him, which I'll look up from this uh, Bible of <laughs> my magnum opus, uh, which I spent so many years trying to write. Um, he says there are no separate persons hmm. but then at the same time he said that we were destined to know it okay. <laughs> due to me he's having things both wise <laughs> <laughs> he's covering all bases <laughs> if we aren't separate people why are we we okay uh He thinks you and all other conscious beings as such are all in all. 
this life of yours is not merely a piece of the entire existence, but is in a certain sense, the whole. Hmm. Well, that's a very difficult idea if you get your mind around and I, I'm inclined to think it's just confused, but <laughs> <laughs> who am I to say that somebody is brilliant at Schrodinger, you know, yes. IQ about 200 or whatever. He's a smart he, guy. He's got that wrong and is being stupid, you know. He, he, he may, he, in a sense, as he says, you know, he says, in a sense, everybody is everything. Yeah, okay. Um, but you don't have to go all that far to see comforts in this idea that the, the universe carries your life and will continue to carry other lives. And it's a single thing in the same way as a particular color, such as the color of purple, is a single thing. It has different aspects, mm -hmm. a blue aspect and a red aspect, but it's a single thing. Hold holding it together, it's a, what, what could be called an existential whole. Uh, this word existential is used in all sorts of different ways. And uh, one of the things that particularly interests me is why the universe exists. And there's a best-selling book by Jim Holt called Why Does the Universe Exist? Which is in competition with um, The Mystery of Existence, which uh, I produce as a set of edited readings. And most of the time when I look up how they're selling on Amazon, Holt beasts me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that too much because he's got a chapter on me in his book, you know, oh, which wow. is a big compliment um, uh, of the interview with me, he, he's got several chapters, but he's, he's got four philosophers and uh, I'm one of them, okay. Um, but the rotter he's put into his title, an existentialist detective story. <laughs> and all the people who are keen on Sartre and the existentialists and so on, they're all buying this book. <laughs> right. Under false pretenses. Uh, I, one of the boosts in my career was, um, being given a chapter in a book by J.L. Mackey, who's a very well-known philosopher, and he wanted to survey philosophy of religion from Plato onwards. And my gosh, I got a chapter when I was completely <laughs> unknown. <laughs> that sure helped. And why does his book sell so well? He, he called it the miracle of theism. And that is a quote taken from the atheist, David Hume, very famous philosopher, who said that, um, the most thing, most miraculous thing about theism, a belief in God, is that some people believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a book. Are, 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 done that sort of are a lot of philosophers thing. atheists? They seem to mm -hmm. most of most philosophers seem to be atheists. Is that is that a um, true? No, that's not true. Is it not? That's no? not true, because you are discounting all the philosophers who work in uh, Catholic schools of philosophy. Ah, okay, okay. And there's an awful lot of people who are Jesuits and things like this. And mm -hmm. if, if you count them up, you know, probably about the same number. So. Right. I always anyway, had that idea uh, that it was, that it was... No, that... A, a lot of people in the modern analytic tradition, which was spread out of places like Oxford, and that's the extent Cambridge are. Mm -hmm. The people in that tradition tend to be atheists. Yeah, large yeah. numbers tend to, uh, of them tend to be very vigorous atheists, saying, you know, belief in God is just not worth discussing. Dawkins kind of so thing. confused as I, I think Schrodinger said this about some people so confused that they're not even wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Because in order to be wrong, you have to you have to say something which makes sense enough sense to be wrong. You know? That's a good line. Um, they, they, that's a typical view that they're not even wrong. Anyway, I have another book called uh, "The End of the World," and this is on the risk that humans will soon be extinct. Um, 
And I think that the world is obviously going to end sometime. And I may be slightly more pessimistic than most people, but I'm still quite an optimist. Yeah. But still, I'm laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the sale, sales prompted by that title. Uh, although a lot of people may be buying it because they think I'm standing at the street corner and saying tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you think we're going to exist as, I, I think personally, this is my view, I don't know, uh, us as humans, as you know, our actual human form, I think we're not going to exist like in that way, like flesh. We're, we're, we're slowly, I think the minute phones happened, that integration with being cyborgish kind of should we say <laughs> that's already started that's that's coming i think but um and then you I could live forever say, too you might be able to live forever too in that way in an actual way provided provided that civilization doesn't collapse very quickly and yes. i think it's a, a race between that and uh, the progress which is going to get us more and more integrated with machines, starting mm. off with something I'd love to have, which is Google directly <laughs> in your brain, <laughs> linked to my brain. So that when I try to think of some quotation or whatever, I immediately, you know, Google, please tell me what, what, what the words are. And they'll come in. No, no, this is this I'm sure is going to happen if we continue onwards. But um, there is a, an article in Wired by Bill Joy, who made his fortune in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, why the future doesn't need us. And uh, I'm one of the two people he, he has there saying that um, maybe he won't need he won't have us yeah. because of all the nasty things we're doing to the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the other person is uh, Ray Kurzweil, who has this wonderful book, the, the, the Singularity is Near, saying that in very short order, computer life, or what will seem like the, the life of intelligent machines rather than the lives of... Um, flesh and blood, humans, is going to be the main thing in the world. And uh, there are some people like Hans Moravec in the field of artificial intelligence mm. who say, wonderful, wonderful, we should all be working towards that because the lives of machines will be much better balanced and much cleverer and so on <laughs> than our lives. Okay, uh, there's this, there is this uh, composition not just between views as to what we good or bad, but mm -hmm. what is likely to happen. And I think it's quite likely that uh, humans will survive uh, for uh, another few billion years, thanks to the progress of science, though maybe they'll just survive as pets. <laughs> That's oh, or in zoos, <laughs> because they're going to be so inferior. I think that's quite possible. It's also quite possible that uh, there will be some ghastly disaster uh, wiping out the human race and possibly the planet Earth as well, yeah. uh, caused by the progressive science. But this is something else, you know. Yeah. Getting away from the idea of immortality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that death is kind of... Uh it's like the more we reach kind of perfectionism we'll say like we'll say androids robots perfectionism the less there is uh i know we're saying the human aspect of things but if you watched uh if you watched uh if tennis existed and it was between two high-end <laughs> ai robots it'd be so boring because did none of them would make, make mistakes and i think that's what's cool about humans, oh, our mistakes or what you, kind you of you can program them. You can program these things to make mistakes. I know, but you're and, still, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I like. I mean, uh, uh, one way forwards in robotics is, uh, sorry, really intel intelligent machines mm -hmm. is to have them uh, think down a whole lot of different paths and to randomize. And one of the ways of getting success, say, in chess programs, is to do Monte Carlo methods and <laughs> yeah. Monte Carlo suggests what's going on, you know, use randomization. You you can get plenty of randomization. And if you think it's 
I think a machine society would see there was a good reason to have people around who most of the machines thought were making mistakes <laughs> because occasionally they'd be right. Yeah. And you don't want to have the sort of view you have in the the Soviet Union. There's one correct way of thinking and so on. Mm. A large number of different ways of thinking. Some of them, most people think they're wrong, but it encourages them to be, be around. Yeah. Uh, Getting back to immortality, <laughs> we, We're we, we haven't dis, we haven't uh, discussed the um, the third sort, which is the immortality of uh, actually surviving bodily death and continuing onwards. Um, and I touched on this because people, certainly in the um, Hindu tradition think that surviving bodily death either involves going to another body or going into Brahman, dissolving into Brahman, maybe touring Brahman and so on. So there's lots of religious people uh, will be attracted to this view, to those views because they are religious people, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm attracted to the view that goodness is somehow responsible for the universe, uh, I'd be willing to think that some of those people might be right, you know. <laughs> um, maybe something like Brahma is out there thinking the entirety of the universe. Um, possibly I'm not going to be so rude as lots of people would be about the idea that I have an internal soul and that will continue onwards. I'd prefer to think that uh, what will continue onwards after my death would be the, the general pattern of my thinking, but against the religious background, improved. <laughs> uh, I, I would be an improved um, person in a life after death. But why would I believe in a life after death at all? Um, well, not not through physics, mm -hmm. <laughs> not the sort of things which would lead me to believe in the second sort of immortality. Um, rather, I think that um, if you want to understand why there's a universe, you've got to look around and see the things which could create a universe. And it wouldn't be enough to find one thing which created everything else because you'd still have the question of why that one thing was there, you know. And this is a question which uh, numbers of believers in the Christian God, for example, face. And some of them are willing to say, well, God might not have been there, but God just is there and has always been there and nothing can destroy God. And that's all the explanation we need for the existence of everything else. I got attracted to a view which goes back to Plato, which is that uh, goodness is behind the existence of the universe. And the way I bring this view up to date, I hope, mm -hmm. if it's more plausibility, is to say that if you're looking around the world of physical objects and so on, um, you couldn't explain that world by pointing to other physical objects because you but there are some things which are necessarily eternal and these are the truths for example of, of mathematics uh, these didn't come into existence with our universe if our universe began in the big bang and there was a time before that it, it, the truths of mathematics would would have been true anyway mm -hmm. um in order to explain butterflies, why th these are real things, you know, you, you have to have something which gets you out of the field of these abstract facts into the realm of actual things. Uh, it's an abstract fact that if there were two sets of three butterflies, that there'd, there'd be six butterflies. That's an abstract fact. But to where in the realm of abstract facts could we find anything 
which counted as a, a reason for the existence of things. Well, at uh, age 17, I suddenly had this idea that um, maybe what you're looking for is a reason for the existence of things which value provides. And um, I've since worked on this idea and said the, the essential idea of things having positive value is that it has a sort of required existence. That's to say, the void, so to speak, aches. <laughs> it wants something to come in there. Uh, and this requirement is satisfied when something exists. Mm -hmm. Well, it would only be satisfied if the something which existed was good, okay? Uh, goodness is ethically required existence. And ethics doesn't just mean morals, because morals, that's a world of duties and so on. You don't have morals, you don't have duties, unless people already exist. Mm -hmm. But you can have these ethical demands that there be a universe, and they might themselves be the reason why the universe is there. And I have worked for many years trying to make sense of this idea, and I thank heavens I've found people who think it isn't nonsense, because <laughs> I mean, most people think it is nonsense, okay, but uh, I have found some uh, very respectable uh, thinkers, philosophers, theologians, and so on, who think that um, maybe this idea is correct. And among the theologians, there's this Keith Ward I mentioned earlier, who used to be Regius Professor of Theology at Oxford. And um, among the philosophers is a, a, an atheist, uh, J.L. Mackey. Um, I had supper with him at one stage. He couldn't remember my name. <laughs> well, it wasn't a compliment. Then I, I yeah. have you read Freud at all? His best book, I think, is The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, when he talks about slips of the tongue and things like this. I'm convinced the reason that John Leslie Mackey couldn't remember my name just for a few moments is that his name was John Leslie <laughs> Mackey. <laughs> you know, he's trying to remember my name. No, that can't be his, his name. Yeah, yeah. But I'm John Leslie. You know? <laughs> there can okay. only be one. <laughs> they can, yeah, this is... Uh, he, he gave me a, a chapter in his book, The Miracle of Theism, and he, he said, look, um, if you're going to defend this view you find in philosophers like uh, Plato and uh, Leibniz that goodness is behind the existence of the universe, well, uh, go and read John Leslie, which is, helps, 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 helps the sale of my first book, not all that, that much, but sure got things rolling, which uh, was very nice. But goodness uh, is, it, it, sorry, but go, it, is, goodness is that, it, that's like a, we invented the concept of goodness because we're humans. Goodness is good goodness to us. You know, to, to a star, the goodness well, doesn't... I think that could well be true about the history of the the idea of goodness. I think the you, you, you look at... Um, there's a, a Penguin book about the idea of goodness, which simply says that, that yes. it started off with the idea which you have in uh, primitive, primitive societies that what is good is what's good for the tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of getting others to defend the tribe, to see things the tribe's way and so on. And then I think things progress beyond that because I think it is a progress uh, towards thinking that you're not just being arbitrary Mm -hmm. When, sorry, you may be being arbitrary when you form your moral beliefs, but they're either right or wrong. <laughs> and the belief, for example, that it's good to go out and slaughter people has been held by various societies, and it's just a wrong belief. And the reason they have managed to 
get that brief popular among their societies is that they have said it's a right belief. <laughs> the people who are really enthusiastic about behaving in certain ways like to feel that there's a truth behind saying, look, this is the right way to behave. It's not just saying mm -hmm. uh, relative to the beliefs of my society and so on. This is the right way. Now, this, the view which Mackey had was that um, good and bad are invented. He actually has a book called Ethics Inventing Right and Wrong, and that is a, a penguin paperback, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, his, his reason, his main reason for thinking it has had to be invented as an idea was he, he couldn't make sense of the idea that certain properties were what were called good making properties. How could the, these properties be linked to their good makingness? You know, right. he, he couldn't see any evidence for that sort of linkage. He, could, he found it very difficult to think that this sort of linkage was anything other than our keenness to see certain properties of actions and so on as uh, leading them as to think that these are the things which should be done, you know. Uh, but I, I, I found that argument very strange because he, he was willing to accept that the ordinary idea of goodness that most people have is that things are good in themselves, certain ways of behaving are good in themselves, not just because we like them. Yeah. The, the, the view you have is probably the view of most modern philosophers of ethics. And uh, I greatly reject this. <laughs> some, of my, some of my best friends think it. They think it for excellent reasons. They have first-class brains and so on. Yeah. But if I believe this, I, I, I would think the life was not worth living. Because for me, being really worth living means that it's a, a fact out there in the universe, you know. I like I like that that idea. <laughs> I like that idea. I do still think that about something like, like you're talking about the idea of goodness and like serial killers. To they're awful. Like to us people, you know, who aren't serial killers, it's awful. But they're born a serial killer, so. Because the way they're born, does that make them bad or good? Now they're born like that. They can't help it. They've they've been born like that. And most people who are serial killers are born serial killers. So are they bad or are they good? Now to us, I mean, to me, you know, if they're bad, obviously. But in the concept of what good and bad is, are they bad or are they good or what are they? I think of it. There is a lot of evidence that they're people can be born with criminal tendencies mm -hmm. as to say criminality is, is has a certain in, inherited side and part of it is, is that the criminals don't really understand how other people are thinking they can't sympathize with people because they can't empathize yeah, with people they can't empathy. they can't really see things from other people's point of view uh, okay that's not their fault um I don't want them to go to hell yes. <laughs> because of this. But at the same time, their way of thinking is wrong. Uh, other people ought to be respected. <laughs> um, most of them, not, not, not Hitler, not certain politicians I could mention these days. They, they, <laughs> All of them. <laughs> but, you know, uh, other people should be respected to the extent you shouldn't go out and kill them and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and going out... I find, you know, this guy, Mackey, I, I very much liked him. Mm -hmm. I think that in his heart of hearts, he, he's one of these philosophers who doesn't really believe what he says. Okay. You know, he says it's in print <laughs> with excellent reasons. But if you, I think it's Dostoevsky who tells the story of soldiers who throw babies into the air oh, God. and catch them on their bayonets. For fun. Jesus. I, I've certainly heard a story about somebody going through Africa and a small pot bellied boy is obviously starving because he has this pot belly, which is, shows starvation, you know, mm -hmm. and having fun 
shooting that baby in front of the parents, you know. That sort of thing, I think, is in itself wrong. Yes, for sure. <laughs> not, not, but the, uh, the typical view of the philosophers is to say that um, you are simply recommending not doing it. You're saying, don't do it. You are giving a sort of command to other people and to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's known as the prescriptivist view. I'm prescribing to other people. I'm prescribing. Prescriptions, they say, aren't, aren't true and false in the way that it's true that Africa is larger than England in surface area. You know, that's the truth out there in the world. And they, they think that the entirety of good and bad is is like that and now if you take seriously the view that there are these facts and that they transcend they go beyond what people like and so on they are sort of eternal facts mm -hmm. then um you might see in these eternal facts a possible reason why the universe exists and uh, Mackey agreed that I I got a possible reason why the universe exists that its existence is ethically required, but he he was just he, he thought the idea of being ethically required was couldn't be defended. Well, I I reckon I I defended it. So, okay. I like I like your idea. Of it. <laughs> I do like your idea. I think it's yeah. I think it's interesting. It's like it's I never yeah. it's not something I've heard of before, and I like I like it. I like it. Well, it? if you've been reading a lot of modern philosophers, you, you wouldn't have come across the idea. Or, <laughs> they, or they would have mentioned it with scorn, uh, saying such things as somebody like John Leslie manages to believe. <laughs> um, are, but, you, are you inherently I, I, an optimistic person? Would you... Uh, I, I, I think it'll take... The view I have will probably spread to a lot of people. Um, I would love to come back after I'm dead and look in the British Museum and see <laughs> my, how many books there are. And, but there's a very interesting story by uh, one of the English writers. His name escapes me because these days practically all names escape me. Not yet my own, but uh, <laughs> um, about a guy who sells his soul to the devil so he could go back and look in the British Museum to see all the references to him, and he just finds one. And he <laughs> finds he's a character in this story by, <laughs> by that particular writer. So uh, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that uh, the view that some things really are good in themselves, bad in themselves, is going to uh, take off and um, that um, the view that the universe might exist because its existence is ethically required is going to take off and if the universe does exist because its existence is ethically required mm -hmm. then I think that pantheism is probably right that uh, we are all part of what you might want to call God but uh, when Spinoza called it God, everybody said, no, he, he's using the God word wrongly. Uh, I don't really mind what you call it, but I think that we might be part of something which thinks about everything we're thinking about. And that involves thinking in great detail about an infinite number of universes. And we are just one of the universes which is being thought about. Yeah. Thought about in complete detail <laughs> and fully real in consequence. Um, I think when you, you have even among the uh, modern physicists, some pretty eminent ones who are attracted by the idea that um, we are part of a, an enormous computer uh, John Barrow, for example, who's got the chair of theoretical physics at Oxford, um, he, he says, well, maybe we should look out at the skies and see if we could have the sorts of errors which 
people make when they try to simulate reality. <laughs> Little glitches. You I know? sometimes look at the sky and I go, man, that looks fake today. I know that sounds weird, but I've so I've well, done that. I'm like, well, that cloud looks a bit weird. I'm all, I'm, well, into, I'm yeah. into that concept of the simulation theory. I'm not well, saying it's true, but I like it. Yeah. I think if people take seriously the idea that we might be inside a computer, they ought equally well to take seriously the idea that we might be inside the mind of God or the mind of something which thinks of everything worth thinking about, um, including our universe. Our, our universe might be pretty low on the, I mean, all it would have to do would be to satisfy Get above the cutoff line. Below yeah. the cutoff line is all the things which aren't worth thinking <laughs> about. And our universe is sufficiently good to be worth thinking about in, in full detail. Yeah. And that's what uh, our lives are. And then if, if you believe this, then you're believing, I think, the sort of thing which the philosopher Spinoza believed and defended in such books as his ethics. And Spinoza is often seen as an atheist. He certainly was willing to say that God was the same as nature. And everybody then said, well, we should just use the word nature, not talk of a God, you know. <laughs> but no, he was serious about this. God was the same as the natural universe for him. Uh, he, however, didn't think that... Um, we'd have immortality, except that God would eternally think about the lives we've read and we've led and whether we've done good things and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a rotten view of God. I mean, suppose an extraterrestrial is thinking me in his brain, the extraterrestrial is super, super, super clever. And he's thinking my world in full detail, just not just me, my wife, my kids, and so on. Has he got a right to switch it off, <laughs> to stop thinking about it? I mean, yeah. dirty rotter. <laughs> Why would he do anything like that? Because kill that... me, kill my wife, and just by switching off? Yeah. Remember, in, did you see the... The uh, film, uh, two, what was the name of the, the film? Uh, 2001? Space Odyssey. Was it? 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, it's it's odd. They, yeah. they have Hal, the computer. Yes, there. yes, yes. He, and the no, no, Kinon, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 being switched off. He is no. <laughs> uh, in control of the spaceship. And when the suggestion is that he's... He's behaving wrongly. He, he fights this idea, you know. I have a right not to be switched off. Uh, I, I I feel that if somebody is thinking my life in full detail and the life of my wife and so on in full detail, they have a right not to switch me off. Mm -hmm. And then I could continue to think and so on after I'm dead by my life pattern continuing onwards, it wouldn't have to be associated with the body, but um, it could be continuing onwards, rather some people think that our lives could continue onwards if we got, if we got our thought patterns transferred to computers. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this, I hope that this will happen to me. Would you like <laughs> that? Would you like to like, live on as a program or just your, your essence well, uploaded to a computer? Uh, uh, uploaded, but you see, programs and so on, they, they can have interesting lives. They <laughs> don't just chug away solving mathematical proofs, but even that could be interesting. But uh, supposing that my life at present is the life of somebody inside a computer yeah it's worth living it's exciting it's i i get interviewed by interesting people you yeah know? <laughs> this sort of thing uh and you, you it, if i continued onwards so i would expect to be given something like the believers well the believers in 
the story of the Chandogya Upanishad. Sorry, the the not that then the Tathagata Upanishad. Uh, they think you're going to tour the divine reality. I think I might be able to learn the entire history of the universe, find out about other universes, learn all sorts of beautiful mathematical truths, yeah. <laughs> hear all sorts of wonderful music. You know, I, I think this all could happen if my life continued onwards inside something which is thinking it and thinking all other lives, you know, mm -hmm. and that would be a, a, a sort of immortality I'd be particularly keen on <laughs> because <laughs> my life has been filled with a lot of frustrations and so on. And yeah. I s expect that it, it would be more fun if the afterlife had challenges and so on, but um, not leading to too many disasters. I, I've been a very keen rock climber and they've suffered uh, couple of nasty falls Ooh. okay I I, I I i want if i continue rock climbing in the next life i, I want to ensure that <laughs> i have all the challenge of climbing <laughs> not all the nastiness <laughs> which which goes with a, a pleasant fall you know yeah. um and i would like to have the pleasures of knowing more about chess which i'm Keen on I'm with you. I'm with you on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I'd like to be learn how to be a better chess player and, and see all. Well, in the end, see all the possible games of chess and know which ones were were good and which ones were bad. Of course, most of them would be very bad, <laughs> but. Um, do you play? Do you I play online? Do. do you ever play chess online? Hmm? Do you play chess online? Yeah, and uh, I I have this. Um... I have an app, chess.com. I have a chess.com app. I do always play on that. It's pretty cool. Always play on that, but you. I hope you would go to uh, my chess variant, which is called Hostage Chess. Sweet. And there's an excellent program. For playing it, which was crazy, not by me, but by somebody else. Um, and um, this program can beat me at the game. Brilliant. Let's and, check that out. Uh, it's that if, if you put hostage chess into your search slot, two words, you would find this, you would find the site www.hostagechess.com where you'd be able to download load this program and download my book on hostage chess and download all the praises of hostage chess by some very strong press players, including people who've been, one person who's been a candidate for the world championship. You know? wow. um, it's um, it's a, a game which uh, I hope will um, spread. And uh, I hope if I get all immortality, I will, uh, <laughs> I would uh, like if I were immortal to see all possible games of hostage chess and which ones were, uh, bad and which ones were really exciting and whether in my book when I selected some good games um, some of them were really good and some of them have actually got tremendous blunders the the trouble with this game is that uh, its decision tree expands faster than that of standard chess because uh, pieces can return to the board it's a game in which if you capture a piece and your opponent captures another piece so long as your piece is of equal or greater value than the one you want to return to the board you can return that piece to the board for example with my queen i can i can buy the knight which you captured because a knight is lower down in, then i can put on it onto the wall at wherever i want now if you tr try to imagine how fast that game expands, it's probably ex decision tree is expanding twice as fast as standard chess. And so although the computer program which the man has produced is searching not anything like as far down as most chess programs would, it can already 
beat people who are experts, strong experts at uh, standard chess, and who are very keen, who've played hundreds of games of this posture chess. My, uh, a friend of mine who's in this class, a strong expert, um, set the program to think for five seconds over each move, and the program will win a large proportion of its games. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> but That's brilliant. If, if, if you set the to five minutes, it won't be much stronger, it'll be stronger. Thinking of it, said it's overnight to five minutes a move, it, it'll get some better moves, but a lot of the time we play the same moves. You can't see, can't really see much further down the decision tree. Wow. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to know what a really would, good program would do. And if I could get some, if I could get those people who've got Alpha Zero working. Yeah. You know what else for zero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It has, it has uh, beaten goal. It, the it goal. got over. It, it, it can now give a, probably a a pawn handicap, possibly pawn in the move to people who are world champions and so on and so beat. Yeah. Uh, in my afterlife, I'm going to hire Alpha Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Alpha Zero's got to be in the afterlife as well, though. That's the thing. <laughs> well, no, no. This is in this afterlife. You see, if the system is being run by goodness, anything which is good is going to happen. And uh -huh. I think it'd be good to give me a lot of things I want. Okay, I, I hear you. <laughs> and one of them would be to have the equivalent of Alpha Zero improving, uh, let, uh, let, let, let loose on this game. To see how good it really is. Yeah. I mean, it might turn out that it's it's so difficult for humans to see down this, to the decision three that it's almost a matter of chance who wins. Um, that's not so because there are grades of player. You can tell how good a game is mm -hmm. by how many grades of player there are. There are definite grades of player, but probably nothing like as many as in standard chess because everybody is having difficulty looking down the decision tree even if they are world champion standards for uh, looking down uh, the best person was probably a, Bobby Fisher a guy who ran the British Chess Fair and Society and he was an international master at standard chess he played chess for Britain and um, I, I was able to beat him in sort of three games out of eight, something like that. Wow. Although I'm a vastly inferior player. He, he'd absolutely take me to the cleaners in every single game of, of standard chess. But the fact that it was in this game, the initiative is so important. Starting an attack is so important. As long as I was willing to keep attacking, I, I could sometimes win, you know. And um, How pissed off was he when you bet him? It, <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but I, uh, it it might turn out to be that it's a game with um, a forced win for one side. I mean, it, I think the verdict is still out on chess as to whether there is a forced win, but the general view is there probably is a forced win for white. Isn't do you, you know enough? Yeah, about yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. That is probably a forced win for white. You know. Mm -hmm. um, Possibly in hostage chess, there's a false win for one side, which would be a grave disappointment waiting for me in my next life. Yeah. <laughs> I but like playing as black, though. I like playing as black. I know people, I know sometimes you play chess online with people, and the minute they see that you're white, they'll just cancel the game because you can just tell they like being white. But I like playing black. It's kind of, you know. Well, I, I like to play black against some people. I, I like to be defeated by my son, for example, because I can feel, look what a brilliant boy I've given <laughs> <laughs> birth to, you know. And, but uh, my friend, uh, who was, the, he, he, he is, um, but his son has gone down with age. He used to be um, about number 10 in Ontario, which went mm -hmm. number 20 in Canada, which is quite, you know, pretty good. Um, he hates losing. Absolutely <laughs> hates it. I would win one game of five and something like against him, and it would really, really upset him. <laughs> he found it difficult to be polite to me after 
<laughs> I can be bad uh, too. I can be bad. I can't. I, 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 sometimes when I'm playing, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's just, <laughs> if I, if I, I, I don't mind losing. I hate losing when I do a move that I go, that I, a really bad mistake. You know, that's, I'm like, oh, mm. dude. But I don't mind me losing to someone who's better than me. I hate losing to someone when I, when I've kind of just made a total blund, blunder. I'm like, oh, dude, what have you done? That annoys me. But other than that. Sorry, okay. you don't want to lose to somebody who's much worse than you? No. No, you, you don't. No. Sorry, what did you say? You don't want to lose... I think you said better than me. No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. I, I don't mind losing to someone who's better than me. Oh, you don't if, mind losing? Yeah, no, okay. no, no, no. But if I lose no, to this... someone that I, I've just made a blunder and I've won, I'm like, oh, no! I get, I, I'm like, dude, come on! That annoys me. But other than that, it's okay. There's a story about one of the chess masters who stood up on the table and said, shouted out to the room, this idiot has defeated me! <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Hey, we shouldn't be discussing chess. We should be discussing great things. But I'd like to discuss for a moment. I mean, what would you do if you had the chance to tour the divine reality, as I'm suggesting might be available to us after our deaths? Um, what would you like? To, I mean, I'd like to learn all sorts of things about the world. And one of the people I really admire is um, Mozart. Mm -hmm. Another is a completely ignorant peasant girl who is talked about by one of these big game hunters who went out and shot tigers when they were man killers. A woman fell down a cliff and the man killer was known to be around and she climbed down and stayed with this woman overnight and was eaten, okay? Right. Everybody else abandoned. I'd like to meet this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'd like to talk with people like Einstein and Newton and so on. He wouldn't mind even talking to Napoleon, who was a bit of a, a so and so, you know, a despot, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, he, he had a very interesting mind and so on. Mm. I can mm. see why there's so many books written about him. He, he I, I, I wouldn't mind spending a hundred years of my afterlife, you know. <laughs> Hundred years with Napoleon. In discussion, in That's discussion a long time. With, you know, but yeah. What 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 would you like? What would I like? Ah, oh, geez, I don't, I'm always I'm interested in. Uh, can I a musician? But I'd love to. I'm always wondering if there is other universes, and we'd say we're talking about the afterlife. Right? <clears throat> what music sounds like on other places, and what they interpret music as. If there is music, I'd love to kind of. I'd love to talk to obviously the great composers and stuff like that, but I'd love to find other beings outside of us humans and what you know, because our our idea of scales is based on like I, I everything we do is based on our us being human, like of, of our of of what we can achieve and what we can think of what we can do. You know, our scale is only a certain scale because that's the way we think as humans, but maybe some aliens. Th their sc our scale to them would be so rudimentary they'd be like well that's like child's what are you talking about so for well, them they, they might not go in for for noises even they yes might. Uh, have you have you read uh, the moat in moat in god's eye no which i think no. is it's a superb uh, science fiction book and it involves people who are interacting with another species which has great intelligence and they have communication by the changing patterns of their skin <laughs> wow and that's interesting they 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 they, they think their music will, will will be changing visual patterns and so on and i can see this could be very good and our perception of life in a lot of ways is, is all based on our reality like what's your reality to you if you if you wrote a piece of music and someone said i don't like that does that mean it's bad? But if you say, I do like that, your reality is 
that it's good and their reality is that it's mm. bad. And a lot of us are human well, beings. Your reality is, is this is sad music and their reality is it is that that's the difference between some Indian music, isn't it? And Western music, the major scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for them the minor scale is the yeah. scale of triumph and so on, not the um very, very extremely strange. Yeah. Yeah, music and, is uh, like one of the most interesting things I think of because it's so there's so much vast things. It's all it's slightly unknown in a lot of ways. I think music because it's just like so you 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 spend quite some time in the afterlife. Uh, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. to get back to that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spend that and yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's like yeah. But to, the afterlife of what our thought of the afterlife is, is like, you know, if if the afterlife is completely different, then that's another story. But I do like the, I love that thing you said earlier about that we could be just a thought in God's brain. That's amazing. I was like, whoa, that's a cool idea. That is just, that's cool. <laughs> well, it, it, it is that it used to be a very common view, um, even among philosophers. And... Uh, that has sort of fallen out of what a large number of modern philosophers think worth discussing. They don't. Uh, I I think an awful lot of the philosophy of past centuries remains extremely worth discussing, and I think a large amount of what is discussed these days will simply be forgotten. Yeah. Is there is um, there is there anything that when you were like a lot younger and you thought of a, an idea and you were like oh my god I've thought of this idea did you ever like look up and see that maybe Plato or some other philosopher well, had actually had yeah, the same yeah, idea yeah 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 yeah. this is all very sad I uh, found out that um, in after studying philosophy at Oxford for one year I was allowed to read people like Plato because you know <laughs> this is for people who shouldn't be misled by <laughs> messy writing and so on but you know although my tutor was an expert on Plato he hadn't uh, pushed Plato on me in any way oh. and uh, I then found out Plato that he had in book six of his Republic the view that uh, the good was something itself beyond existence that's to say it's something abstract but was responsible for the existence of the universe. I was so annoyed. <laughs> my idea. My idea. That, you know, that has happened in other fields. At one stage, I, I got interested in telepathy. Yeah. And I worked uh, out a wonderful theory as to why telepathy worked when it was so evolutionally bad. It, does, it worked so inefficiently, you know. The attempts to prove it with car guessing and so on, they, people are doing it practically no better than chance, or sometimes mm -hmm. it's given as evidence of telepathy, they're doing significantly worse than chance. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had the idea that um, the normal form of telepathy would be telepathy between your brain at one moment and the brain at your past moments. Ah. It would be telepathy with your past brain, and this would allow you to. I mean, some memories can be extremely vivid. Uh, some people can remember all the details of something they've seen just for a fraction of a second, mm -hmm. and they can see two things each for a fraction of a second, and their memories are so good that they, they can superpose these two things and see a hidden pattern. Sometimes you can only see it when these two sets of lines are put one over the other. This sort of thing is, is one of the marvels of human memory. I haven't got that sort of memory. But, but I reckon that if, if this telepathy with your past brain were working reliably, that would give you a, an immense advantage. And that's why telepathy is there, although it seems to give you such a little advantage because telepathy we're normally aware of is telepathy, sorry, which you normally talk about, is telepathy between, say, mind, your mind and mine, you know. It, 
it's not working terribly well. You know, I can see from your expression. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, I took, um, <laughs> I remember a lot, oh, maybe two years ago, uh, me and this girl, we took, <laughs> we took a lot of magic mushrooms, let's just say, and we could actually, I, it sounds so weird, but we could, I could hear, feel what she was thinking, she could feel what I think. I mean, we took an absurd amount, and uh, at one stage, I knew the whole secret of the universe and all that, and then after that, yeah. I forgot everything. But yeah, at that, <laughs> at that exact moment, I was like, I know exactly what you're thinking. She's like, I know exactly what you're thinking. Now, obviously, we took magic mushrooms, but, but, but I mean, there is those kind of things that, that um, you know, I think... I that... can see why people believe in telepathy. <laughs> yeah. Because they've had this yeah. they've had this sort of experience you've had. Yeah. But um then I found in the British Journal of Philosophy of Science somebody who's developing my theory <laughs> in great technical detail. This is Ian Marshall, who is um great on the idea that um human consciousness involves quantum effects in the brain, uh, an idea which I'm very keen in, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, human consciousness involves quantum wholeness, which is rather like the wholeness which I was talking about, about the whole universe may have, yeah. but particularly we're aware of it in our brains when we're conscious of things. Ian Marshall, I think, a great scientist, and he defended this with complicated formulas and so on and my theory <laughs> <laughs> so your theory if if if, if I'm, I'm not going to put words in your mouth but I, I've given up the theory I, I then looked into telepathy and since I couldn't claim any any ground here I decided it doesn't work I mean, hey, it's worth revisiting yeah, but, well, but, oh, but, okay but, but anyway on, my th- oh sorry but based on the uh, based on your idea of of of, of, of like that you could telepathy telepathy to the your past self yes. if, if that was true or, or or it could be true um could you kind of almost if is that a form of like time travel if it is and also if you could communicate with your past and you did change something in your past self even though you're in the future now would that essentially is that how like a multiverse could happen? That at that moment you've changed the past, so it splits off into that, and that that's its own universe, and you're in your own universe. If that, if you get well, me. Some people try to deal with the idea of time travel by having a splitting universe. Yes, mm-hmm. and um, I'm simply talking about travel in one direction. Just straight there from straight back. the past to my present mind. Okay. Okay. I think if you have time travel in both directions, you get into terrible paradoxes. And one of them is known as the grandfather paradox. You yeah, can yeah. kill your ban- grandfather when he was a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't have a chance to reproduce, you know. Uh, I think you, you come into that paradox practically any sort of backwards time travel if, if you can get the thing going in a circle. Mm-hmm. There is some evidence in physics that you can get small time travel circles. In fact, you probably have to have them in order to understand some physical experiments, right. okay? But uh, if you have big ones, uh, then you would get into such immense <laughs> difficulties that the system yeah. wouldn't work, the universe would simply fall to bits if, you, right. <laughs> if that was happening. Uh, but the, the theory is that uh, normal memory very often involves telepathy with your past brain. And um, I, I'm not completely sure that the theory is wrong. Um, people like uh, Bertrand Russell, who I greatly respect as a philosopher, yeah. uh, toyed with something like this idea. And this guy, Ninian Marshall, has given it physical respectability and so on. And, so it might be, but particularly if our brain cells and so on is just sort of scaffolding and something else is going on on top of the scaffolding, quantum fields or whatever, um, it, it could be that telepathy works. It could be that this, which I was looking into as a possible basis for memory, works as well. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> it would be. 
Have you ever heard? <laughs> have you ever heard the stories of people? You know, DM. You know, DMT. That 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 drug. There's like a lot of people have these crazy stories about DMT that they every. They, it's always the same. They they take. I've never took it now, but they take DMT and they meet these kind of entities, and it's always this kind of nice experience. And uh, there's a story about a guy who um, he took DMT, and he's every time he took DMT, he'd have his girlfriend like a DMT like it was in another universe this girlfriend anyways his friend took DMT at his house and his friend said to him hey I met someone you know and he's like who and he named the girl now the guy never told him about this girl that he used to trip on he was like whoa that's crazy he's like she's jealous about girls you're with in this reality so (laughs) whether it's true or not it's just a crazy it's crazy that you could take something that would do that to your mind but a lot of people have the same experience of when they take it, that it's all to do with like um, that they see these entities, and it's like it's completely mind blowing. And some people do like art based on it. It's crazy. Like, well, it could be that you're getting some sort of insight here into how reality actually works. Yeah. And similarly, it could be the people who have religious experiences. They they feel in the presence of God and so on. Um, if you say, look, they've got these experiences because they poison themselves. Yeah. Well, poisoning yourself <laughs> is to lash yourself repeatedly because yeah. you then have a suffocating wound mm. and that poisons your system. And some people have these experiences of God and so on only after doing this. Well, mm. um, my suspicion is they aren't having genuine experiences of God. But who knows? It could be that the normal doors which keep certain realities out are opened by the poisons and so on. This is the view which Aldous Huxley had. With, yeah, uh, yeah. He, doors of perception, heaven and hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's to say that he's obviously wrong? Yeah. To say that these experiences are produced by poisons, so what? You know. <laughs> Maybe poisons are what you need to open the doors of perception. Yeah. And of course, it's calling LSD a poison is, is a bit, it, it certainly has all sorts of medical advantages to give yeah, people, yeah. some people LSD. So, in some ways, it's not, you, you, you call a poison something when you think it's bad, but it, it could be good. There's a great book on, on, on LSD. Um research that was it was like a how to change your mind it went into all the research in the 50s and 60s that people used to treat depression and anxiety and stuff like that and it was only when the kind of counterculture in america happened that they were like oh we got to mm-hmm. stop this and now it's kind of there's a big resurgence of like people like microdosing and stuff like that so i think there's lots of benefits in that kind of stuff whether entinal pass with our lovely pharmaceutical companies that's another mm. story altogether well, i uh... I would be reluctant to try this, Steve, because I think my mind is already... <laughs> I mean, I, I, lots of people su- suppress uh, strange thoughts when they come to them. I'm constantly bombarded by strange thoughts, uh, to which I uh, sort of entertain. And uh, one of them is this view that the universe exists because it's, its value, which I've worked on for so long. But there's all sorts of other thoughts which come to me, and I, I think I'm Surely, I, uh, if I th- think about this too much, I will go crazy. You know? And then I, <laughs> I, I, in the end, get rid of them. But I, I think if I took LSD, I might end up being permanently crazy. Yeah, um, it can have an adverse so effect on people. It's, it, it, it's like, I luckily, when I take alcohol, I get sick very quickly. <laughs> right. And so I'm not likely ever to become an alcoholic. Some people get benefits from alcohol, yeah, and some people become alcoholics. And I'm glad I don't fall into the latter class, you know. Me either, me either. Um, but this is, I mean, getting terribly far away from this. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think there's actual evidence in favor of the view that the the universe is. Our universe, at least, is a product of goodness. And um, have you come across the talk about fine-tuning of the universe? 
I've read something vaguely on that, but it wouldn't be. Yeah. Wouldn't be well, massively. that is becoming ever more popular among the physicists. They see that if you change various things which come into their formulas, such as the masses of various particles and the strength of various forces, mm -hmm. the degree of smoothness or roughness of the early universe and so on, if you change these things very, very slightly, you get a universe in which life wouldn't evolve. And there are two views around this. Uh, one, sorry, three. One, it's all, no, all, all nonsense. It, it depends on having a, a limited view of what life would be. You know, life could take all sorts of strange forms. That's one view. Then a lot of physicists are, physicists are is so saying we can understand how early in the universe the forces of nature split apart and particles took on different masses when before they'd all been massless like the photon the particle of light hasn't got any rest mass as they call it um they think that what came later could have a large amount of randomness in it it, the randomness then got frozen in mm. and they th talk about a large cosmos which has regions in it which are tuned in different ways with respect to these things such as how fast the universe is expanding what the mass of the electron is compared with the proton this sort of thing and they say of course we will only see the sort of universe in which things are tuned in such a way that beings like us can exist. Yeah. Or indeed, tune in such a way that anything worth calling an intelligence could arise. They're willing to say that in practically all these sub universes inside this cosmos, uh, things are tuned wrongly for life, and we have a selection effect. And the competing view is coming from a few the theologians and philosophers of science saying, yeah, it is a selection effect. It's a selection effect by God. God done it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I am sympathetic towards the selection effect by God, although I see God here through the spectacles of my platonic theory. God could simply be the force of ethical requiredness creating a universe. Okay, but I, I, I think the God done it uh, view could be correct. It has a, an advantage, a strange advantage about the other view. Mm -hmm. The other view is this is all about a randomness. But what we find is very often to get any sort of life, you have to tune different things, such as the mass of the electron, the strength of Planck's constant, the uh, the number Q, which refers to the smoothness of the, of the early universe, you have to tune all these things simultaneously to get a particular result. Right. Why isn't it that tuning in one way, tuning one of these knobs, so to speak, doesn't mess up tuning elsewhere? No. How come that you can get the life... How come that there's anywhere yeah. where all the knobs can be tuned correctly, okay. And I came across this, um, this argument occurred to me when I was writing my book, Universes, which I was read by um, John Polkinghorn, who's at that stage, professor of physics at Oxford. He paid me the compliment of reading all through the book. And he very kindly said, you know, among books on the fine tuning of the universe, this is the best, you know. And then he said, oh, but of course there's only one thing original in this. <laughs> <laughs> and that this point of mind, this point of mind, that it's strange that there'd be any universe in which all the knobs could be twiddled without getting, in all cases, non-life, non-life. Mm. Uh, that view has recently been, the idea that it, this is very odd has been discovered again by Max Tegmark, independently, completely independently. And he uses it as an argument for the view that absolutely all possible physics are 
physical laws, all possible systems of physical law are created. Uh, and this is rather similar to the view of uh, the very well-known philosopher David Lewis, which is absolutely all possibilities are are real somewhere, not not in our world, you know. Yeah. But all the Greek gods exist somewhere, you know, <laughs> somewhere Jupiter is, is having fun with his fights with Mercury or whatever. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, now, if he's right, then all possible systems of physics are represented somewhere. And somewhere there'll be some set of basic laws of physics, which leads to a universe where we're, if you twiddle all the, the knobs correctly as with respect to the tuning of the, the strength of electromagnetism, for example, compared with the strength of the gravity. Mm -hmm. If you tune all these correctly, you get a universe in which living beings could see the universe. Uh, I think the trouble with that is that you'd also get a lot of universes where you and I have been discussing things and then suddenly you turn into a toadstool <laughs> and I explode. <laughs> so, because uh, the sheer fact is that there's lots of different ways in which the laws of physics can suddenly break down, you know, mm -hmm. and if all the possibilities are, are present, there'll be universes like this. Um, one way of looking at it is that if you scatter dots at random on graph paper, it's been known it's for centuries that if you if you had a sufficiently clever mathematician, he could make a curve which went through all these dots obeying a formula. Yeah. So that would be sort of like one law of physics. But most of the curves on sort of like straight line counts, counts as a curve, a parabola counts as a yeah. curve. Most of them will suddenly go crazy. <laughs> And this would be according to our world suddenly breaking down. And I think Tagmoyt's view falls down on this stumbling block that if you have everything in there, you're going to have an awful lot of mess in there. And we're probably in the middle of the mess. We're probably in the sort of situation where our lives have been typed by a, a monkey typing for sufficiently long in the, <laughs> on a computer. And in, in the end, he. he he produces a, an encyclopedia, but his next next thing he produces is almost certain to be rubbish. <laughs> uh, this is all discussed in, I have in this book, which everybody should be reading, The Mystery of Existence. Brilliant. Um, I've reprinted Tegmark as he gets... I think he gets the longest thing in the book. And the reason is that Scientific American insisted on this. They said, you can't cut it. <laughs> so I, I get to, to cut great philosophers like Cato <laughs> down to a couple of paragraphs. <laughs> I recommend. <laughs> because it's not just all, I must confess, like there's a chap, there's a paper of mine in it, but there are papers by all sorts of people going all the way back to Plato on the question of why the world exists. And it ends with discussions by modern scientists. And I think if you want to know why the world exists, if you think there is an answer, it could well be one of the things discussed in this book. And if you think there's no answer, that also <laughs> is one of the things. This is, and there's a sort of in-between view which is that um, there is no answer, but we can understand that this is inevitable. This is a logically necessary truth. It's a truth that um, there could be a universe. I mean, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a truth that there might have been nothing. And if these were just the basic facts, there could be nothing which decided between them. There wouldn't have to be anything that decided between them, which selected the one rather than the other, because they, they couldn't neither of them be selected. Yeah. That would be impossible. That would be like a married bachelor or whatever, you know. They couldn't both have been selected. 
so one of them could just happen to be right. <laughs> and that, that I find is a, a very compelling view. And um, I think it's wrong though, for reasons I, <laughs> I give, in, give in the book, but yeah. the, the, the book has uh, things by all these scientists, things by quite a few philosophers, even if it's in th something by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, wow. Well, yeah, could could help sales. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was surprised. I was surprised sometimes when I go into things coming out of the Far East. I can't understand them. They fit into the category. They're not even wrong, <laughs> which I mentioned before, because yeah. they seem to me so confused that they couldn't even be wrong, and this Dalai Lama, recent Dalai Lama is um, clearly very clever and he knows about, about modern science and so on. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's not a, it's not just a marketing gimmick to have him in the book. He's contributed something. And I, there's other stuff there by a representative thought in Islam, which I thought made sense, you know, I don't agree with it, but I, I could see that this could well, you know, I don't agree with Christianity either. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, lot of clever people out there who, who do. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, so uh, I recommend this book as if you want to have a book which discusses, which has the thought of people through the centuries on why there's a world instead of a blank. This is the book for you, The Mystery of Existence, which um, my co-editor was uh, Robert Kuhn. And uh, he's the one who runs this Closer to Truth yeah. in immense series with hugely many people and so on. He's the creator and the host of this. Um, when he was interviewing me on the question of why the world exists, I have a certain amount of notoriety in this field, you know. <laughs> I'd be one of the first people you'd think of to have seen this Turned out that I'd been worrying about this since age 17, and he'd been worrying about it since age 12. <laughs> he, he knows an awful lot about it. He helped me a lot in selecting the people to be reprinted and in the huge bibliography of other people who didn't get reprinted and so on. And this is remarkable for somebody who his original field was brain science. He got a doctorate in brain science. Then he went into investment banking, yeah. made a fortune. And now he's spending his fortune interviewing people like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I found out about you, that show. I watched a, oh, a, a I lot see. of those episodes because they're yeah, well, he's he's my co he's my co-editor for this book. Oh, that's cool. And um, I, I, it's not just that I wanted cells to be better than the cells of Jim Holt, <laughs> or his wider <laughs> the world, which is quite an interesting book. It, this book is a lot of it is quite hard to understand. Okay, but um, this is where you should go. <laughs> I'll check. And it out. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that. Uh, after a bit, this will be one of the standard courses in universities. Uh, whereas it, at present, it's anybody can write a book on Kant and get it published somewhere, you know. Right. Even though they are already all these in this book on Kant. Much harder to get a book published on Bertrand Russell, who I think is a really great philosopher and tremendously interesting these days. Yeah. And... Uh, the books by philosophers of religion tend in the West to be by people who are Christians or very little else. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a strange field of philosophy. It's, you know the expression nature red in tooth and claw? <laughs> yeah. About well, it's, the, like, it's like everything. Well, though. as seen by Darwin. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing to nothing to ivory towers, ivory towers in which <laughs> philosophers are interested. 
uh, dripping with blood everywhere. <laughs> well, so, like in every field, you know, there's it, there's always politics, isn't there? There's always like there's always people politicking, and it's uh, it's you yeah, know this, one, this this view that there are multiple universes used to be dismissed. Yeah, yeah. Then the view that the multiple universes could all change in their properties that too was dismissed. No, it's sort of the standard view. Mm -hmm. Just as the standard view of the world is continental drift, that the continents have been drifting apart. And for a long time, people said, what nonsense to think of the <laughs> continents careering around the place. They didn't reflect that uh, the continents are drifting apart at about the rate at which your fingernails grow, you know. They, they didn't think of the immense length of geological time that... I think I saw a calculation once, if you were walking across the states from one side to the other, and you take a, a step every century, <laughs> you get to the other end wow. within the time. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it is very strange, as you say, that everybody's fighting. And uh, I think it's a good... A great pity because I think there's a lot of unusual views which don't get don't get a hearing, and I, I'm been very very lucky that my unusual view has has managed to get a hearing. And I'm a believer in many worlds quantum theory, and I think there's all these other worlds which I'm ever so disappointed <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, uh, before I let you go, because I've taken up a lot of your time. Um, the I, it's just the, oh, we, we could go forever, but anyway, the, the idea of parallel universes, do, do you think it's, do you think the parallel universes concept of it is that it's us as ourselves in other universes, or is it just their parallel universes with different populations of beings, or is it the concept well, in, of us in, are in, infinite parallel in, in, universes? If you take one version of par parallel universes, we're bound to exist uh, because this is the many worlds quantum theory and so i will have we'd be having this conversation right now in another universe essentially we'll be having this conversation now and the universe will split into ways in which the, the conversation goes differently and there'll be a vast number of these ways except uh, Drifting apart might be better than firmly splitting, okay? Yeah. Some of these branches branches might come together. So that's one way in which we could be reproduced. But on even the standard view of the simplest cosmological models have an infinite universe and everything gets repeated. Yeah. We will be having exactly this conversation a long way away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and it will be repeated not just once, but if the universe really is infinite, it'll be repeated an infinite number of times. But of course, for each person, they won't be bored because <laughs> all the other people are having the same <laughs> the conversation. They won't know it. You'll have to go an awful long way through the universe before you get a, something like us. Yeah. And then, even if you think that uh, you have a whole succession of universes coming about as what are known as quantum fluctuations, say. Either there's a background space and they fluctuate into existence or mm -hmm. there's no background space, but nonetheless, they still, for some reason, they uh, covered. The simplest way of developing that theory would be to have an infinite number of universes. And again, you get the infinite repetitions. And some th people think repetitions like this uh, wouldn't be worth having. But I, I don't understand this. My wife is, my life is worth having. My wife is just as good a wife, even if there's another universe in which somebody just like me and just like her. You know, uh, I, I think it's absurd to dismiss this view on the ground that it would be boring and so on. <laughs> Uh, so for us to so, for us to actually exist in another universe, they actually have to be the exact same. Everything has to happen the same because if 
if the t- most my new thing happens in the in a, in a universe, I mightn't be born, or you might be. You know what I mean? So it, they actually the concept of the multiverse is just that it's our universe all, all existing in the exact same time. Everything's everything that's happened will happen. Whereas you know, there's this kind of concept, especially in, you would say within Marvel movies, it's like in one universe you're bad and in another universe you're good and it's like well that can't really work because everything would have had to happen at the exact same way for you to actually exist in that universe and to everybody else well no i don't think that's because if, if this is coming about by yeah. chance because you you have all these possibilities you can have as much chance in each particular universe yeah no each each particular universe could have gone a different way or will go a different way but of course at one uh, point in time at just one split point in time you could live your life till 10 and then something might happen uh, in your and then something happens i mean look this is um what is said by uh, max tegmark in his article he says uh in one of these other worlds which is bound to exist somewhere uh you got it to this point in reading this article and then you put it down <laughs> and then he hopes you you'll be in another world in which you can continue reading I mean, you know the, the russian roulette you know the russian roulette thing that if you put a gun to your head and you shoot yourself in one universe it doesn't you're alive and then the uh, <laughs> what's yeah, your I, what's your thoughts on that my thoughts on that is that you can still get on these universes probability measures right and the probability measures saying even there's an infinite number of these things the range of the universes in which you manage to kill yourself with your Russian roulette with one shot depends on the number of of what's it places you put the bullet in the bar the barrel it yeah the, the number of slots in the barrel yeah yeah Yeah. okay and if it's a six shooter you have a six chance of killing yourself yeah so don't say you know there's all this infinite number of universes in which i won't kill myself and then kill pull the trigger because the statistics are you have a one sixth chance of killing yourself (laughs) now some people are worried by the word infinity they say as soon as you have two infinite uh, groups um, you can't compare them i think if they really believe this against the background of believing in the multiverse they could we have a lake at the end of the road you know Mm -hmm. i could go out and try walking across the lake and in some of the universes all the water molecules would happen to at the right moment be moving upwards <laughs> just as in some of the universes you put a, a a kettle on top of a block of ice and the block of ice gives heat to the kettle and makes it boil you know <laughs> but the chances of my getting across the lake <laughs> even though there's an infinite number of lakes like this are very very small because mm-hmm. the range of the lakes even if there's an infinite number of points on a dartboard where a dart can land, uh, hitting the centre is rather hard because the range of those points in the centre is smaller than the range of all the points on the dartboard. Mm -hmm. I think the same sort of thing. But but you can't talk, though, about what happened with the view there's a multiverse because there's all sorts of views that there's a multiverse and you get into a multiverse use if you just think there are two universes and a lot of people would say yeah there's a, a large number but the, the number is given by inflationary cosmology inflationary right. cosmology at the early big bang everything gets enormously inflated to enormously big um there will be a huge number of worlds like planet earth in the resulting system but no no other worlds in which you and i are having this conversation that's just too too particular (laughs) it's it's just not not enough worlds uh, you know yeah 
Uh, it depends which which version of the, the, there's so many different versions of modular theory these days. Yeah, it used to be they, you know, one or two. They used to be say the oscillating cosmos, big bang, expand, then it comes back through gravity, big crunch, big bang again. And one view was John Wheeler's view. John Wheeler being one of the great, the really great uh, philosophers and physicists. But he was a physicist and philosopher just because he had such good philosophical ideas. <laughs> okay. um, John Wheeler th thought that every time the thing went through the big crunch, it could come up with different properties and so on. And that uh, is still defended these days as one version of multiverse. Lots more people defend the many worlds quantum theory view. Lots of people get their multiverse through lots of separate big bangs, not even against a background of a, a single space. They just, they somehow, they, they big bang out of nothing. Vilenkin, Alex Vilenkin has got a, a wonderful book, Many Worlds in One. And I would recommend that as one of the most interesting books you can uh, read in, if you get into physics reading. Yeah. Cool. It's interesting. It's all interesting. I find getting into philosophy of cosmology extremely interesting because it was just by chance I got into the argument from design and looked into the view that this fine tuning was evidence for it and that I started writing in philosophy of cosmology and I looked everywhere. <laughs> All the philosophers was cosmology. They were just doing the Big Bang and uh, Einstein series and so on. And I, I, I got in first. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> and immediately the the invitations started rolling in, and I, I started reading an awful lot of very interesting stuff. Oh. Uh, the, uh, out there. If, if, you, if you want to become a, in your next incarnation. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, a, a physicist, I mean, there's modern physics is, uh, modern cosmology has got some very interesting stuff going on all, all the time. Cool. Well, John, thanks you so much. It's a fascinating conversation. We could, I could talk to you. I'd love to talk again sometime. I'm sure you're busy, but I'd love to talk to you again about other stuff uh, because we kind of scratched the surface. Yeah, I know there's too. loads. Thank you very much. Um, uh, have a lovely, what time is it there? Half twelve, one half one, one o'clock, two o'clock. It is now five to one. Yes. Okay. We'll have We've a lovely. We've been speaking for two and a half hours. Flew by. But I'm going to check okay. out your book. I'll Thanks. Check out your book. I very much appreciate being oh, on this. Thank you very and much. The podcast is podcast is going to be called Hold On to Color. Hold on to the colors. Hold on to the colors. On to colors. Yes. Yes. Okay. Spelt our way. Not the American way. <laughs> and actually British and uh, Canadian spelling are officially the same. Oh, are they? Oh, yeah. So Americans... in, a lot, in, a lot, in a lot of the things I, I write, I get published in the States. They, it always has to be colours <laughs> spelled the other way. No. The wrong way. The wrong, wrong way. way. <laughs> the wrong way. <laughs> All right, John. Hey, thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed thank it. Thank you it very much too. Fascinating. Bye then. Uh, bye bye.